is Friday with him and that's why I am smiling. Good morning. It is Friday, April 11th. We have a great show here for you as usual. We have the news headlines. We have the weather report. We have today in history. We have our favorite reporter from Wareham Week, Nadia Karitnokova, in the building. We have it all. So for today's show, we're going to take a look at living with metastatic breast cancer, one woman's mission to fund for metastatic breast cancer research. And also last Saturday, the Wareham Land Trust, together with the Wareham Boys and Girls Club, did a screening of saving sea turtles. We're going to take a look at that footage today not the movie but just what went on um, during the event and we will be concluding today's show at the elizabeth and company home offerings aka echo but first i would like to take this moment to thank not your average antiques an antique shop down cranberry highway in East Wareham for donating the props that you see in the morning show. So stay with us because the weather traffic report and the news headlines are next. today but we will see a high around 50 degrees and the low at 46 expect some rain tonight we will see periods of light rain early tomorrow with high at of 62 degrees and the temperatures will drop at night to 49 degrees Overcast on Sunday with high near 65 and low near 49 degrees. Expect normal traffic around 3 and 495. The weather conditions are good, so safe travels everyone. And now to the news. There were a few news stories over the week and here. Okay, we are going to start with this news. WCTV plans for uncertain future. The Board of Selectmen signed a yearly contract with WCTV at its April 9th meeting, but the station's future is still in question as Federal Communications Commission policies uh, that fund for local public access television are in flax. Local access television stations are funded through a franchise fee cable companies pay to municipalities as compensation for using town-owned land to build the necessary infrastructure like cable lines to deliver cable services to residents. Under the proposed rule change, cable companies could be allowed to offset franchise fees by deducting certain in-kind services uh, from the total granted to cities and towns. However, exactly what uh, cable companies could be allowed to count as in-kind is a complete mystery. If the FCC rule change goes through, the board and WCTV will revisit the agreement. And moving on, Wayham Man wins a million dollars through a Rotary Prize. Nicholas Labelle of Wayham got the, uh, the, the surprise of a lifetime when he became the 14th $1 million prize winner in the 2017 edition of the Massachusetts State Lottery's 100X. 100 times instant game. LaBelle chose the cash option on his prize and uh, he received a one-time payment of $650,000 through tax, though uh, taxes will be withheld. He and his wife plan to use uh, his winnings to pay off the mortgage and their 
of the, uh, on their house and put some aside for their daughter's college education. And in another news, no troubled waters at Wenham Fire Water District Annual Meeting. The Wenham Fire District Annual Meeting flew by on April 8th uh, as all motions were passed with um, near unanimous votes. Um, firefighters, sorry, safety upgrades and firefighters hi hiring new call firefighters and a new fire prevention officer and improved technology were all approved by voters during the meeting. Voters also funded uh, the uh, removal of asbestos um, pipe insulation on at Station 1 on Main Street. The district's election will take place today. And that's all I have for the news headlines. Stay with us because Nadia is here. Friday, which means Nadia Karitnakova is in the building this morning. She is here to digest today's news and possibly tomorrow's news. She has some uh, scoops for us, some inside scoops. So stay with us. Welcome, Nadia. Hi, Gwen. Hi, how you doing? Great, thanks. Um, so let's start with, where would you like to start, Nadia? Is it the new school? With Patrick Tropiano's announcement? Uh, I think it would be appropriate to first announce that uh, Patrick Tropiano was... Um, so the s s Board of Selectmen unanim unanimously voted to move Patrick Tropiano for the um, uh, chairman position. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary Bruce is going to be a clerk. Oh! Yes. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, Alan Slavin used to be a chairman. Yes. But now it's going to be Patrick Trupiano. And the same day, Patrick Trupiano announced that um, the official opening of um, Minus Forest Elementary School, which is going to be December of 2021, um, as opposed to the suggested uh, September 2021. Mm -hmm. The main reason for that is because um, the Wareham will have to pay much lower rates for the construction because there a lot of work is getting done in the summer in general. So the con contractors will charge lower rates to complete school in December. And also yesterday during the school committee, the public school super superintendent um, Kimberly Shaverhood, she also mentioned that by opening school in December, the teachers will have um, the ability to show the kids the school during the school year, the new school during mm -hmm. the school year. So the kids will have a small tour of the new building because starting a school year in a completely new building without knowing where to go, where the classes are, might be very confusing for the kids. Absolutely. So the kids will first have a tour for over the school mm -hmm. and then they will move into this. So it makes more sense in a sense. Oh, fantastic. Yes. So now we at least have the opening date, December 2021, yes. which is what, like two years from now? Yes, it seems like pretty soon to me, mm. but uh, I will be happy if they will be able to complete it in such a short time. This is exciting. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, we st they still have not decided the name of the school, right? Uh, no, for, as of now, it's just referred as Minot Forest Elementary. Mm. Yes. At Minot Forest Elementary School, what is it? Uh, Dickes Elementary at Minot Forest Elementary. Yes. Wow, that's a mouthful. Yes, it is, and it's very confusing. Yes. D d did they s bounce off some of potential names, maybe, they're looking at? Uh, I haven't heard of that mm. yet, but I will keep an eye on this, definitely. Okay. Yes. All right, so that is something to look forward to for uh, mm -hmm. in the year 2021. I'm very excited to see the whole process take place, come to fruition yes. part by part. Um, okay, so Patrick Trapiano is now the chairman. Yes, he is. 
what did he say anything his comments uh, well in his comment he is he and um peter tattenbaum mm -hmm. and um, a few other members of uh, board of selectment they thanked ellen slavin ellen slavin for doing such a great job over the past year mm -hmm. because uh, being a chairman takes a huge toll on your time and uh, I, w I would assume health as well because sometimes you're sleep deprived you have to work an extra hours so well most of them are retired oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, um, Alan Slavin was great, and um, yeah, I always enjoy him coming in the studio to fill us in on what is taking place. Mm -hmm. Now it's Patrick Tropiano, and I'm looking forward to working with him. And you know that he's very open too. You yes, know, so. yes, he has many great comments every single meeting. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> he's just a comment machine. <laughs> <laughs> he's a comment machine. Yes. yes. Um, okay, and then we are going to have what a hig hunt. Yes, so Onset Bay Association is going to hunt, um, is going to host, sorry, an mm -hmm. uh, egg, egg hunt, Easter egg hunt this Saturday for kids up to age of 12 mm -hmm. in uh, Prospect Park in Onset. I've never been there before, but I'm really excited to visit it. And uh, it will also host, um, within the park, there's going to be an area for kids who are younger than five years, five years old. It will be like a safer area, area for them to mm -hmm. run around. And uh, I spoke to uh, our, their organizer Kat Jones yesterday and she said that uh, the association, the volunteers, are going to hide 8,000 eggs. I was so surprised, it's like such a huge number. So 8,000 8, eggs plus the eggs and they will have either um, coupons or chocolates, small toys, uh, a bunch of different stuff. Uh, are they hiding money? Because <laughs> I would love to go if they're hiding money. Especially the twenty dollar bills. I think I she wish, just yeah. Stuffed them with twenty dollar bills. But uh, unfortunately, since it's only for twelve years results. <laughs> That's <laughs> nothing fun for us. There's another egg hunt taking place at the YMCA, right? Yes, yes. And that is the flashlight egg hunt. You have to pay yes. to to get there. I believe that for members is seven dollars. Uh, registration cost is five dollars. Um, yeah, and for non-members, I believe you pay $9. So that sounds fun, but still, that's also for the kids. Yeah, it is as well. Well, it's good for me because I'm going to attend it anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to reap all the fun. Oh, <laughs> my. Are you going to uh, participate, you think? Um, well, I don't want to snatch sweets from the kids, but oh. I will just take pictures of them. <laughs> I mean, they won't. They yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, 8,000 X is a lot. In Russia, do you celebrate? No, we don't. That's why I'm super excited to attend this event. Is this your first? It's my first, yes. Time oh attending this. My yes. God. I really wanted to go when I used to be uh, when I used to be a student. I, I really wanted to attend this kind of event, but again, there for kids, so I didn't go there. Oh, yeah. that did not stop me from <laughs> dressing up and go trick or treating at age of 17. Oh, cool. Yes, with all the young ones in the neighborhood. Because I didn't, I, I didn't go through it, so I, I wanted to take my time, <laughs> you know, with it. So this would be great. I think, truly, you should take your pictures, work. You should be the first one to get there. Yes. Take your pictures done, and then mm -hmm. play with the kids. Just go and yes. hunt for the eggs. Whatever you find, put in your own pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, just pay the fee, $9, and then, you know... Put it all in your pocket. Yes, but I want to mention that uh, the egg hunt that Onset Bay Association is hosting mm. is going to be free. Okay, yes. yeah, that's free. All right. And you will also be able to attend for, I believe it's $5 for adults and $3 for kids to attend uh, pancake breakfast at uh, McAnthony's oh. prior to the event, which is going to be from 9 to 11. Pancake breakfast? Yes. Nice. <laughs> they should have waffles. <gasps> Belgian waffles. Mm -hmm. That would be sweet. Well, well, this is great news. Things to look forward to. Um, and so thank you, Nadia, for being in the <laughs> building. Your face reminds us that it is Friday. Cool. I'm glad you have some positive associations with my face. <laughs> with your face. Yes. <laughs> Whenever I see you, I'm like, it's Friday. <laughs> thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you, Queen. So that was Nadia Karitnikova in the building to digest some news. And we are going to move on on and our today's first featured program is living with metastatic breast cancer a one woman's mission to raise awareness and funds towards
In one short sentence, Barbara Bigelow sets the record straight. I'm a badass. True, given that 13 years back, she battled cancer and won. And, you know, I went through the whole lumpectomy, radiation, chemotherapy, horrible year of treatment, and I finished. I thought I was done. But then, in 2015, 13 years later, my back was killing me, and I called my back surgeon, and he said, get an MRI and come in and see me. They found a tumor behind her kidney that turned out to be metastatic breast cancer. This stuff, and hey, by the way, there's this mass over here under your kidney. And she was looking at a prognosis of 24 to 36 months. That was just a reminder that you have to live in the present and not postpone things because you just don't know what's going to happen. Barbara's story takes me to the University of Massachusetts in Boston to speak to Dr. Jill McCosker. Dr. McCosker is a professor of biological sciences and the director of personalized cancer therapy, a joint program by the University of Massachusetts Boston and the Dana Farber Harvard Cancer Center. She says metastatic breast cancer is when the cells actually mutate and they mutate in such a way that they actually change their identity mm -hmm. and become almost like another cell type that's very motile. Um, it's called um, epithelial mesenchymal transition and it's been very well documented and actually that's how cells can weave say the primary tumor and they'll travel through the, uh, the cells, will travel through the lymph, lymphatics or the bloodstream to a distant site and establish there as another tumor focus. A National Cancer Institute study published in 2017 that looked at the prevalence of metastatic breast cancer estimated that metastatic breast cancer is on the rise. The study also shows that despite the poor prognosis of metastatic breast cancer, survival of women initially diagnosed with the disease has been increasing, especially among women diagnosed at younger ages. Early dictation being a pivotal factor, though it doesn't guarantee a cure. With men, unfortunately, because they're not expected and they don't have a culture of um, examination for breast tumors, survival is a bit worse, and it's because they're caught later. Treatment for metastatic breast cancer is lifelong and focuses on controlling the disease. Barbara was diagnosed with a rare form of metastatic breast cancer, a triple negative breast cancer. What it means is that we don't have any receptors to target because we're triple negative. So the chemotherapies and treatments that are available are for other types of breast cancer, not mine. Although she understands what metastatic breast cancer is, it's a fatal terminal illness. She is however surprised of how little is being done towards fighting it, especially given that 114 men and women die every single day in the United States of metastatic breast cancer. Why aren't people outraged by that? The lack of enthusiasm towards public outcry and funding she feels is due towards the stigma on metastatic breast cancer and its victims. I feel like we were marginalized. We were, we're like dead people walking. People are like, well, you're stage four, we're done with you, and kind of threw us out. With that, Barbara has been an avid advocate towards raising awareness and funds towards metastatic breast cancer research. She warns not to get distracted with the pink ribbons. You know, the big pink companies that do all the race for the cure, well, they've been racing for 40 years. <laughs> they haven't gotten any further. And they don't really want to give money to us, and they have huge administrative costs and overhead. Um, so that's one issue. And then the other thing that burns me is that in October, when you're in the supermarket and, you know, you see a can of green beans and it's pink for breast cancer awareness and you buy it because you think somehow that's helping, that's for profit. She has chosen to support Metaviva. I was really impassioned by them because 100% of the money that Metaviva raises goes to metastatic breast cancer research and it's the only nonprofit organization in the United States 
that Good gives a hundred percent. So this February, Barbara participated in New York Fashion Week in support of the nonprofit. She was one of the 23 models, the only one from New England, sacheting modeling lingerie made for women with breast cancer. The theme of the show was not just one, that we're not just one. The event raised more than $100,000 towards Metaviva and its endeavors in funding metastatic breast cancer research. Research that Dr. Makoska says it's crucial. We're not there yet. We can't save everybody. And so there's a lot of room still um, to do more research to develop new therapeutics that could be effective against tumors that don't respond to the ones that we already have. You decided on not million photographs. Well, we have a million photographs, right? Yeah. In, so these are the only pictures I really have. Those are the surviving photos? <laughs> this is me in Santorini, my favorite place in the whole world. This is Tim on top of um, Whistler in Vancouver, one of my favorite places. Kelsey uh, in Spain, in Madrid, in the park. She did a summer there and we went with her. And this is Bridget in New York City and that's me and Kelsey walking away from her. <laughs> so all these people that I worked with and I love and adore all wrote me these really cool letters and Bridget put the pictures of the people in, that was the principal. As to how Barbara keeps her spirit high. I put my feet on the ground, I check the obituaries to see if I'm in it, and if I'm not, I'm good. <laughs> From her personal experience with metastatic breast cancer, she works to inspire others. I want to give other, well, primarily women, because mm. that's the majority, but I mean, I want to give women hope that when they get diagnosed with it, when they're told, like, you have stage four cancer and it's you no know, cure, you're, you know, it's terminal, I want them to know that there is life after that and that they can have hope and they can go on and live. The takeaway here is that life is unpredictable. You know, you, your path goes in a different way. You take a left turn when you're thinking you're going to go right and that happens. And I mean, the difference is, you know, you, you could get hit by a bus tomorrow but I'm standing in the middle of the street and I can see the bus coming for me. So it's just, you're living on a different level. Did you have a sit down moment with your girls to let them know what this means? Maybe what will mean to them? They're not like that. They had to grow up in a world that most kids don't have to grow up in because they were exposed at such a young age to needles and IVs and I mean, I'm glad you asked that question because I haven't thought about it, but as I'm talking about it, I realize I don't need to. They, they totally get this. At the age of 61 years old, Barbara Bigelow has a renewed focus. I want to say that I made a difference. Mm -hmm. And also my legacy is to leave behind my tumor samples and my blood and stuff that I've donated to the Broad Institute at MIT um, so they can continue to research. I'm not going to be cured of this, but I hope that through research that they find new things in the next 10 to 20 years that might help my daughters who are very high risk now. They're really high risk now that they have a mother and two aunts with breast cancer. So I'm hoping to, to, that the research will find something for my kids, your kids, everybody's kids. They will all benefit because we're all in this together. What a remarkable woman. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting her and speaking with her. Um, so now we're going to move on to our second featured program, and that was the, that is the event that took place last Saturday um, the, by the Wareham Land Trust in conjunction with uh, the Wareham Boys and Girls Club. Take a look. Thank you all for being here and thank you for inviting me to introduce the movie and for showing the movie. I'm just going to give a very, very brief introduction to the sea turtles in our waters and then about the cold stun event, which really this movie is largely about. The, the movie only talks about the smallest sea turtle in the world, Kemp's Ridley, 
which are also the most endangered. They're federally listed as critically endangered, and they make up 90% of the ones that cold stun and wash up on our beaches. If someone finds one, they should call us right away, but move the turtle up above the high tide line, so above where all the seaweed is, cover it with dry seaweed, and then mark that spot with a stick, or you can draw an arrow in the sand, uh, so we know where to come and get it. But as far as in the summer, it's really more boaters um, the, to, to not go on autopilot, to watch in front of your boat so that if a sea turtle or, or some other marine species surfaces, you can avoid it. So often... I work at the Marine Biological Laboratory down in Woods Hole, and so that's how I met Karen and, and the Mass Audubon, the Wealthy Bay Wildlife Sanctuary and their efforts. So what we do is, um, their organization with the volunteers that walk the beaches, they save the turtles, rehabilitate them, I'm sure she told you all about that, and, uh, but sometimes some of the turtles don't make it. And so what we're able to do is in conjunction with Mass Audubon and NOAA and some of the other conservation groups, um, after the sea turtle stranding season, we get together and um, do uh, sea turtle necropsies where we basically try to understand, well, you know, why did they not survive? And then the ones that didn't survive, we also can have the opportunity to take um, tissue samples. We'll take samples of their tissues, samples of their fats, um, we'll take measurements about from their body in that. And so my group, what we're able to do is we're able to use those tissues that are taken from the turtles and um, look at things like uh, their, the lipids and like the, the, and that are in the fats. And we can learn a lot about their diet and what they're eating. Um, we can learn a lot about their physiology by looking at that. Um, we can also look at stable isotopes. So uh, it's a way to see where the turtles are in the food chain as far as like diet and it also tells us a little about habitat when we look at uh, isotopes or the carbon isotopes. Okay. One of the really interesting things we've seen with the Kemp's Ridley turtles is that the really small ones, so that's the thing is that the turtles that are stranding here are juveniles because just and you'll see in the movie, you know, their life cycle, they're traveling up the Gulf Stream as juveniles and then as it gets colder, they turn south and that's when they get, can get trapped in Cape Cod Bay and they can cold stun. But so what we're seeing is when we look at the Kemp's Ridley juveniles and we look at their stable isotopes, their diet looks very different from, it's about when they're two and a half kilograms um, in size, which is about 7% of their adult weight, something just changes. Like you see this pattern where that, that nitrogen signal is changing very rapidly and then it levels off. And we think it could either be a change in diet or it's a change physiologically that the turtles at that moment are experiencing, um, you know, is they're, is they're developing. And we don't know what that is yet. So that's kind of the neat thing is, is like, and that's kind of the fun part too. Is sea turtles in our waters are here feeding. And the three real hazards that they face are entanglement, and especially that occurs in vertical, fixed vertical line fishing gear, such as lobster pots, conch pots, where there's a, the trap on the bottom that's weighted and afloat at the surface, so the vertical line. They can get entangled in that. And because they have to breathe air, they can drown. Secondly, vessel strike. They get hit by boats. Um, and that is the, we know, the cause of quite a few of the deaths in the summer and early fall in our waters. And then thirdly is plastics. Um, we all know there are plastics in the water, and this is a field that's more and more research is being done on. I mean, sometimes they ingest a big piece of plastic, which can cause discernible death but we don't really know the effects of the microplastics that are in the water, so that's something that there's ongoing research about. And welcome back. So we cannot do the history segment this morning. Why? Because we had so much um, in our agenda. So much news, so many videos. So, uh. so anyways, we're gonna go straight to our coffee segment which takes us to Echo.
In this WCTV special program, Skip Wait shows us how he makes his Russian fan birds. And I make them from the beginning to the end. First thing I do is I get a nice green piece of pine that I got from Williams sawmill over in Wareham, Mass. They're kind enough to donate it. And I have to take this fro, it's called a fro, this tool, and split this wood so that I can make a fan bird. And you can watch me split one. I've already quartered it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this just like this. That's a good spot. Don't mind the noise. This fro is what the pilgrims used to use to make shingles. Works very good for that, but I'm using it to make a bird. All right, there's phase one. Nice green piece of wood. Now, phase two. Let me get this to stand up. There you go. Good. Now I'll take my fro, and I'm going to cut it like this. This way first, like that. Nice. Now we'll do it again. Oh, nice. Look at that. That could be a shingle. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Nice straight grain. That's what I need is a nice straight grain. And we'll do it one more time. All right. Those pilgrims worked pretty hard, you know that? Oh, look at that. There's my first Russian fan bird of the day. Will you wait and see what we do next? All right, let's go in and get this prepared. Okay, so we've got our piece of wood now. Our next thing is we've got to make this fairly smooth. Not flat, flat, but fairly smooth and clean it up a little bit. So I'm going to get my trusty fro out again here. And we're just going to give this a little split. You'll see what I'm doing here. I'm just going to give this a split like that. Very nice. And we'll do the same thing here. Like this. See how easy that splits? That's because it's so nice and green. They save all that stuff. I might want to make something else with it. All right, put that away. Put this away. I'm going to take a one inch chisel and I'm just going to like. You call it planing it if you wanted to, I guess. I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to make it clean. Kind of flat. Good place to start. You could probably do this with a plane. You could do it with a carving knife. I kind of like to use the chisel. But you could do it any way you want. This is the way I've been doing it for years. So far, so good. Nice. This is the top of the wings. Down here will be the bird, so just so you know where I'm heading. It's very, very interesting. It's all about a young man that was sick in Russia in a little building. And his, he wanted someone to come back, and his dad said he'd make him a bird. He made the first fan bird. He was a basket weaver, according to the legend. And uh, he hung it up in front of the fireplace, and it started to fly. And the little boy got better, and he woke up thinking it was spring, which is kind of cool. 
After I read the legend, I decided to make these things. Now what this is, this is actually the patent of the wing. Right here, this circle, if I slice down here, slice down here, slice down here, always stopping right here. I gotta stop it right there. That's gonna be the design of the wing. This has to go all the way across here like this. That is my stop point. That's what every time I come down here with a knife, it'll stop right there. As I keep going, you'll see why. I'm gonna cut here. I'm gonna cut here. And I'm gonna cut here. Now what I'm doing, I'm gonna take this wood out, this wood out, and part of this wood out where you got the arrow. See the arrow there? I'm going to take this wood out. As I keep going, you'll see me doing it. This is fairly flat right now. And the only reason I'm saying it's fairly flat is because I want to start taking this wood out now. So there's no reason for, to flatten it all. Save yourself some energy. So what we're going to do, we're going to start doing a little bit of carving now, which is probably more fun than that scraping stuff. Uh, here goes the beginning. This is the beginning. Before you know it, we'll have a bird. Maybe. Yeah. Nice and green. Remember, that's the secret. This is called green wood carving. Because that's what I'm doing. I'm carving everything green. Now, put that there, take this out. This is just another gouge of a sort. Just cleaning up my cut a little bit. Okay, now, I did that line there. I'll do exactly the same thing here. Going right across, keeping that as straight as possible. We'll turn it the other way. All right, we're getting there. Now we're making our design, the beginning of it. Take that out of there. Now what this is gonna be called, from this point forward, those two lines are gonna be known as the interlock. And that's where this bird is going to interlock at the tips of the wings. As we keep going, you'll see what I'm talking about. I know it sounds strange, but it's true. It is a true story. We're going to make a hummingbird here. And the reason is, I like hummingbirds. If you like hummingbirds, stick with me. If you don't, wait till I do another one, I'll do a blackbird. We go right here. Okay. Perfect. This is the easy part. We're making the V. And in a minute, we'll make it on the other side. And we'll clean it up. Piece of cake. There you go. See how we're cleaning that up? There you go. Do the same thing over here.
And what this is, this is called the hinge. The hinge is where it's going to attach on the back of the bird. And I want to say that this is going to be the hummingbird. So you get the idea. Somewhere right there, it's going to be the beak. I may go straight around with it, I don't know yet, but you know, somewhere there will be the beak. Somewhere in here will be the head. And this is the back. The head can come up like this. This is the back of the bird right here. I am going to take that down to about the thickness of a toothpick. And that's why we're going to fold it. And you watch me fan these birds. After I write it, I'll cut this first. And then I'll bring that down to the thickness of a toothpick. Just so you know where I'm heading, that's where I'm heading. So now we're going to take this. Mallet. And let's go down on this side. Well, welcome back everybody. We have cooked the wood. It has been boiled for four or five hours, soaked in the water overnight. I put it in a couple of plastic bags, kept it cold in the refrigerator, and now we are ready to work on it again today. So we're going to have some fun today. I'm going to teach you what riving is today. If you remember, that's where I split the fibers of the wood. But before I do that, I've got a little more shaping to do, so we'll shape up the wood a little bit more, and then we will rive it. That'll be the next thing that we do. Now, if you look close at the wood, you'll see all these little spots. Not only will you see how wet the wood is, but you're going to see all these pitch spots. The pitch has actually been cooked out of the wood, some of it. There's still some in there, but... This was fairly fresh wood to start with. Sometimes I have to cook it a lot longer than that. Depends on the uh, moisture in the wood. Shaping the feathers. These will be the feathers. It will fly, I'm sure. That's a joke, then. Okay. Kind of fly. Okay, there you go. Now these designs, every one is different. All you have to remember is that this part is the interlock, and this part down here is going to be the hinge. And that's what's going to make it all work. So as long as we have a hinge and an interlock, we can use all kinds of different shapes and designs. And that's why you can't find two birds that are the same. They don't need to be. They want to be different. They're like me, everything's different. And right here, where you see me taking it off, this is where I'll take this down to about the thickness of a toothpick right there when I'm done. Okay, this is a vise and I am now, this is the bird that I'm going to do. So I want to start at this end. That'll be my tail. So I'll cut uh, that way and I'll come this way until I get to about here and I'll stop. Now watch what I do. 
Now I'll tell you that this is probably the toughest part about making a bird is knowing how to do this. If you don't do this right, you can't fold it. Then you end up with no bird. The spoke shaver, also known as my riving knife. Now we are gonna, hold on, let me double check this, make sure I'm right. Yep, okay. I'm wrong, I wanna start that way. There we go, now I'm right. Okay, now I stand up. And watch what I do here. I'm going to take a little slice right off of this. This is, I'm going to do this. Now watch. Do it again. What I'm doing is I'm going to do that until I get it nice and square. That's nice. There it is. One. Buy one of these little spoke shavers and practice doing this for a while. Believe me, it is the hardest part about making the bird. I fought this. When I first tried doing it, nobody told me I had to cook the wood first. Just shattered every time I tried to do it and shake my head and say, what the heck? How do these people do this? And I see these birds and I was flabbergasted. Finally, somebody told me the truth. You gotta boil it first. So now we boil. Got it. It's harder to go through the knots than it is the. I'm not supposed to use wood with knots. But sometimes we do. Not on purpose, but it was in there. In a while. Okay, we'll take the vise. Get it out of the way. And we'll bring this board back up. Now we're going to start. That's the tail. We'll get rid of that one. It's no good. Get rid of that one. Oh, maybe that's a good one. Okay. All right, now we're going to trim this down a little bit. See that? Here comes the bird. He's in there. Now if you look close, you can see where I've started to draw the bird. This is where it's going to stay attached. I'm going to take this off. That'll make sense in a minute. Ah, did you see that? Gone. Don't need that bad. Now you see the bird? These are the wings. Now we'll shape it. Now we'll shape it. Now you can hold on to this. There we go. One hummingbird coming up. There's a lot of different ways to do this. I could take a saw and cut this with a machine saw if I wanted to. But that's not how I do them. I like to do them all by hand. See, I can hold that now by the what will be the beak. 
so that I can round off the sides. See that? Just making it nice and smooth. Nice. Same thing on this side. You gotta always go with the grain. This side goes easier than the other side did. You can sand and sand and sand this. I can get it down nice and smooth. Leave it a little rough. You can do whatever you want to do with it. You know, it's your, your little project. But here we go now. I'm going to finish working on this little. Now, if I should break this, I'd make it a different bird. So, uh, the hinge, the hinge, the hinge. And I want to put it back in the bag for a couple of minutes. Let that water get into this hinge that I'm making right here. Let the water get in there really good. Then after the water gets in there really good, we're going to turn around and fold this thing, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when I'm done. Let's take a little break and let this soak in some water. Okay, so what I want to do now while this bird is soaking, I want to explain to you the different ways you can make the birds. This is just a little, a little bird, a little body, but if you look really close, you'll see his tail. That tail is grass, and I wove the grass in between the tail after I folded it when it was still green, then let it dry. That's totally different. I, I love that little bird. Now you can get so creative and have so much fun. I'm going to show you another one that I don't think anybody in the world except me does. Now that's a cool looking bird, right? But it doesn't even start to get cool until you look at the tail. Look real close at that tail. Now look at this. This, these long ones and these green ones are all attached. There's one piece of wood. I did that when it was green and wet during the folding process. I carved this different at this end. Those are the first four or five, first five that came out. The next six that came out, I left them long like that. Now, I told you earlier that I really like little hummingbirds. So here's a couple of little hummingbirds. But look, this is still one piece of wood. On this side, I actually drilled a hole through the wood, then I rived it, and then I folded it. <laughs> this one, I drilled a hole in a little ways, and I folded these long ones and brought them into the holes for that tail. Check that tail out. That's an interwoven tail which I don't think anybody else does those. I've never seen them done anywhere else. That's interwoven. This is still one piece of wood, and they're lovebirds. I think that's pretty wild. All right, it's soaked. It's ready to go, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the tail, fold, Fold, interlock. There's your interlock. Do one more interlock, like this. Interlock. See the interlock? Now that's going to be the tail of the bird. Now I'm going to take this one. I'm going to pull it forward. Push it over. Watch me now. Take this one here, push it forward, push it over. See that? Now, take this one, do the same thing. Interlock it. 
This one here, yeah. I'm going to interlock it. I'm, but you can feel the fibers breaking as I'm doing that. It's like a tree, you know, when you're going to cut a tree down, it's still held on by that little tiny bit and you cannot get it off. I'll tell you what, I could take a giant man and ask him to pull that as hard as he possibly could, <laughs> and he cannot pull it out. It's only a few strands. That's all you need are a few strands. This is still soaking wet. All right, now look. I'm folding now, interlocking. I'm going to, every other side, that's all I'm doing. Interlock. Okay, now here we go again. Pull, interlock. Pull, interlock. Now I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know what? I kind of like that bird like that, but I want a full tail. So instead of continuing to do the front feathers, I'm going to start making a big fat tail. Because I want to. I can do anything I want to do. Once you've done this though, remember you cannot undo it and do it again. Unless you do it right now. I mean, you can do it right now, but can you see how thin it is? Okay, here we go. Now some of these are not quite as thin as the other ones because you can't be perfect. You do the best you can, that's all. Five left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Perfect. So this one here goes over here to make ten over there. So it's exactly the same. I'm going to let that dry. After that dries, I'll cut that off with a pair of um, fingernail clippers. Let it dry first. There's your bird. Is that cool? Now you can paint them, hang them, set them somewhere, whatever you want to do. Put them up this way and let them sit and dry like that if you want them. Dry it for three or four days. Then you can paint it, shellac it, leave it natural, whatever you want. And that's how you make a Russian fan bird. Thank you. If you missed us this morning, do not worry. This episode will re-air this evening at 6 p.m. That concludes our show. We do not have a show on Monday, but we'll return here on Wednesday, business as usual. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and I wish you all a pleasant, warm weekend. Wham.